Okay. We are back. And we're to do the same thing we did this morning. We'll try to get this thing right. Okay. I, I like this series on perfection. It really helps me see predestination much clearer. And I've been studying it for, oh goodness, since I was 21. And that's over 50 years. And uh, if, if you think you ever come to an end of study on any given subject, you have. For yourself. <laughs> that means you can't learn anymore. But if you don't believe you've come to the end on a subject, you'll learn more. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm seeing more clearly predestination now than I have ever seen it. Because it's everything about maturing, going through the fire and the trials, the persecution that breaks us and causes us to be meek. The word praus, meek, means to be tame because we're wilder and bucky bronks when we start off as young believers. <coughs> we always gather together to, uh, I'd like to start off reading to you some, I read my emails Sunday morning and I read my letters Sunday night, and uh, we've got all kinds of letters, and I'll read a few of these to you. I've uh, got a letter from Rob Davis in Cedar Park, Texas, and his family. They love the truth and say good day. Can't thank you enough for the truth. I love it. Can't get enough of it. Keep up the good work. And then they sent an offering here, stipulated what it was for. Uh, Agape Robin Elizabeth Davis. Uh, would you send us a lip, list of other sheep in our area? And I think we're trying to do that for them. And, uh, and then we've got uh, a letter here from... from... Uh, who is this? This is from Tulsa, Oklahoma, from Brenda Vargas, I believe it is. Hello, Jim and Mary. I am a longtime friend of Barbara Wilson here in Tulsa. Barbara has been sharing DVDs, newsletters, and programming with me. I have enjoyed this study with you. I hope you can send Barbara your 911 DVD. I'm sure it's good, my friends. My friend's money is a mess, so I'm sending a gift in her behalf until things for her get better. Agape, Brenda Vargas, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We appreciate that, Brenda. We love you guys for being a part of us. Then Dave Wood writes to us. He's in Clarksville. Dave <coughs> used to come here about 1997, 98 when we taught at the house. And this is from Dave. He's, he had been living down in uh, Louisiana, down around New Orleans for quite a few years. Dear Jim and Mary, the Lord has kept me able to work, so here's a little more to contribute wherever needed. I understand you help feed folks and the poor, so please place this where you'd like. I know it will go toward good. More will come as God wills. Do you have a way of making MP3 disc? Yes, we do. I sure could use them, if so, for daytime listening. If not, that's okay. I watch the DVDs every night. I just love to listen while I work and drive, like the old cassettes. I love y'all. My life would be empty and meaningless without hope for eternal life, but no other teacher seems able to lead us to it. But you, Jim, thank you, Scott Wood. We love you, Scott. Come down and visit us sometime. Huh? Scott. Scott Wood. Why did I call him Dave? I don't know. His first name, David. Oh, is that his first name, David Wood? He's oh. Our, he's, our middle name. he's the one that had the brother who was the boxer, didn't he? Yes. He's supposed to box one of the big names or something. And then we got a letter here from Vicki Clark. I don't know if I can read all this. It's awful long. Uh, dear Pastor Jim, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
I love my DVDs you've sent me. They stay in my player. I'm a 57-year-old woman, mostly homebound. I called for one of the Easter, one on Easter, and had written a letter requesting the series on tongues, but before I could mail the letter, I received the series in the mail. Imagine my surprise. Having been raised in the Assemblies of God Church, I'm very familiar with tongues and being slain in the Spirit. It's always frightened me, and I've even prayed for God not to visit this upon me. What's called it's phony. You don't have to be afraid of Pentecostals. Just get in there and jump up and down with them. They don't care whether you mean it or not. What is, what is slain in the spirit? Huh? What's slain in the spirit? Where they whack you and you fall down you and get... It's something that Catherine Kuhlman invented. Benny Hinn got a hold of it and he, and he whacks people and they fall down on the floor and they're shaking and they look ridiculous. First of all, the spirit quickens. Zumpael makes alive. The spirit doesn't kill anybody. What a stupid, stupid doctrine. <laughs> I mean, that's... Haven't you ever seen Benny Hinn whack people and they fall down on them? Jason showed me the lightsaber thing, so now I understand. And he'll swing his coat like that and they'll all fall down in the front rows. <laughs> yeah, he'll go when they'll all fall down. <laughs> Benny Hinn is a moron. <clears throat> First of all, he's a liar. He got he he said for years he was a Jew. He said for years he was a Jew, and then current affair investigated him and found out he was a Palestinian. I've studied with many other churches. I believe the closest to the truth I've found is the Seventh Day Adventists. No, do you get away from them? They are first cousins to Jehovah's Nitwits. But Jim. You've got them all beat. Well, I don't want to beat them. That's kind of like saying you beat the false teachers. It's kind of like you won against the guy that never was running. Uh, thank the Lord I've found you. I've studied on my own. Also, what is your take on the book of Enoch? The book of Enoch is part of the pseudopigrapha, pseudo-false graphe writings. It don't mean nobody wrote them. It means they don't belong in the canon of Scripture. They're commentaries from, you got the book of Enoch, the Assumption of Moses, the book of Judith, the, uh, the epistle of Thomas, the epistle of Barnabas, the, and it goes on and on. Well, these are not part of the canon of Scripture. The early church fathers say they don't belong, but they do have some facts in them, just like a commentary I've got up here. You can find out some things about the ancient world, and you can find out some things about history. But don't take them for uh, canon of Scripture, because they're not. Uh, which brings me to a request for information on demons and the fallen angels. But I've been preaching on it, and I'm going to touch on it tonight. I've ever been called out in the church as being a demonic for not speaking in tongues. No, they're demonic for speaking in tongues. And demonic is self. And allowing my granddaughter, I raised her, to do this. We well, stopped doing that. They wanted to take her to the altar and pray her through. Now, that always got me. That's an old Pentecostal saying to pray through. Pray through what? <laughs> now, you got to get down to the altar and pray through. That's a... That's an idiom. It means to, you go from non-spiritual to spiritual down at the altar in a Pentecostal church watching people be healed. I know that puzzles you having been an old J.W. Well, this stuff is foreign to me. Huh? It's well, and... it's not to those of us who've been raised around it. <laughs> Pray through is like, it's a Pentecostal idiom. It's a Pentecostal idiom only. I've heard about praying through. What they mean is get down at the altar and pray and pray and cry and squall and carry on and, and boo-hoo and do that for about three or four hours and you can pray through. Wouldn't that wear you out? Yes. Yes. And of course, I had a hissy fit. <laughs> yeah, I bet you did. You make my day. Some, some days, yours is the only human voice I hear. I've loved to pick your brain, but will content myself with my DVDs. 
you get, when you come to grace and truth, you get the green light to call liars, liars. Sometimes people come here and they'll say, <clears throat> well, I had a wonderful teacher where I come from. I say, well, did he tell the truth? Well, no, not exactly. Well, did he believe in Christmas? Yes. Did he believe in Easter? Yes. Did he believe in free will? I accept Christ and the sinner's prayer. Yeah, he did. Then I said, he was lying. They say, yes. I say, well, what do you call a man who doesn't tell the truth? You call him a liar. Well, won't you call that nice guy, preacher that you used to have, call him the liar that he is. I'll give you the green light to do that. Anybody that's out there lying, call them the liar they are. I don't care how nice they are. Nice doesn't mean anything. Nice guys are not going into the kingdom of God. Nice is the word niskir. Nay, skir, no knowledge, no science. If a man doesn't have any knowledge, how's he going to get into heaven? But they're, it's not that, not that they don't have any knowledge. They're acting nice. They're playing dumb. They're acting like they don't know what's going on. I'm just a nice guy. My name's Billy Graham. And I'm just nice. I don't believe he's that stupid like he acts. If you'll keep sending them, and you know what? That'll make some people so mad and so angry. I'll never watch Jim Brown again. Well, you follow Billy Graham, he'll lead you right into hell. If you'll keep sending them, I'm sure, sure my questions will be answered in time. You're on very late here in Tulsa, and I do my best to stay awake to see you. God bless you for the truth you are bringing and if I don't get to meet you in this life, I'll be looking for you in the next, if I make it. The sinner's prayer never brought me any comfort either. Your friend in Christ, Vicki Clark. Well, thank you, Vicki. That's a, that's a good letter. And then I got a letter here from, uh, let me see here. I'll read. From, who is this? This is from, uh, Philip Pickens. He's in Tulsa, I think. Uh, Dear Pastor Jim and the flock, agape and flail from a sinner. Thank you. <laughs> I pray God pours his blessing on you and all the sheep. Thank you for all your specific teaching on God's words. I like that word, specific. So that we may learn. Could I please get some DVDs on your lessons on gematria? You sure can. I have heard you reference the subject and would like very much to know more. Thank you in advance. In close is my effort to help the needy. I am grateful God has made me able. Thanks to all who work so hard to provide us with the lovely messages to feed us. Philip Pickens. We love you, Philip. That'll be enough reading. I've got more. I could read all night, but I can't do that. Put these over here. And... Uh, May I remind you of our announcements? We're on TV. We're covering all of Nashville and all the suburbs. They're hearing us. They know the guy with the chalkboard. Some people know he's crazy, and some say he's not. Some say all kinds of things. Some don't care. Uh, me and Mary's done at Publix last night. I I pointed out to her the lady that. She's kind of a friendly lady, but one night I was going to the checkout counter and she's reading my shirt and she said, what does that mean? I got to explain it to her and don't remember what it was. And I said, well, do you watch the guy on TV with the big board and he writes all the Greek words on the board? And her answer was immediately, I don't want to watch that guy. I said, I said, well, that's me. She said, well, I'm sorry. I said, don't worry about it. And I just kind of grinned because <laughs> that's, that's what it's supposed to be. But she seems to be getting more and more friendly. Maybe, she, maybe she's watching. I think she's a Catholic. Catholics, Catholics, C-A-L-F-I-C-L-F-L-I-C-K-S, -I -C -C -I -I -C -K -S, Catholics. That's what Gerald calls them. Gerald used to be a Catholic. You got to get him to talk about being a Catholic. 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 I used to be a Catholic. <laughs> Gerald's funny. He said he used to go out. Him and his priest used to go out and get drunk together. And uh, 
Of course, priests do that. I said, why did you go with him? What? I said, why did you respect him? He said, what? I didn't hear that. He said he was buying. Oh, he is buying. Okay. But the Catholics, they go out and drink with their people. That's what they do, don't they? It's like there's nothing to them. There's no appearance of evil there. It's like, well, everybody drinks. huh? Yeah, you can't be sinning if you're with a priest. Anyway, uh, remember our our needy people. If you want to help some of these needy ladies that are struggling to live, I mean struggling to live. I have been there as a kid. I've struggled to live, just try to make a living and try to put bread and beans and potatoes on the table and I have been where some of the people here are. So if you want to help the needy, you send a check, make it to Grace and Truth, put for the needy on the bottom of it, or benevolent fund, and it goes to them. All right. Well, we don't. I'm not going to start announcing our picnic till somewhere after the first of the year. Is that okay? No. All right. No, it's not. People come from around the country, and we have... Have a good time together, don't we? We do. Well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, thank you. My glasses got stuff all over them. That's why I can't see. Let's look in your ears. I think Solomon. No. Couldn't see either. I don't know. <laughs> she likes to give me a hard time. And look at him. He's going trying to hide behind these. I know what he said. What you said. Why does he give? Why does she give me such a hard time? No, oh, I don't know. Tell him the truth. Because I deserve it. <laughs> yeah. A whole bunch. It's Sunday night, and we are in a study on the doctrine of the devil, but it's actually the doctrine of demons or the doctrine of demonion. Now, the Bible says there in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, The Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from faith, and they'll go to something that's completely opposite to faith, They'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And the word devil is the word daemonion, D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. Daemonion is our word demon, and that's the word in the Greek text. You'll either, when you have a translation of the word devil, it'll be one of two words, daemonion or diabolos. Now, we don't believe in demons here. We believe demons are self because this word daemonion means to distribute fortunes. To distribute fortunes. Uh, there is a word in the Webster Dictionary. You can look it up yourself. It's called U D A I M O N I S M. It means a well or a good demon. That's what it means. America was founded on this doctrine called eudaimonism. It is the welfare, 
welfare for the most people. This was a doctrine that Thomas Jefferson studied and he believed in. Thomas Jefferson was a heathen. He was a deist. He wasn't a Christian. He said he wasn't a Christian. People try to say, oh, yes, he was. He says from the grave, no, I wasn't. Now, eudaemonism means, it actually means happiness and contentment in life are a well distribution of fortunes. That's, that's a term for democracy and capitalism in America. Most people don't even know that. You can actually look up eudaemonism in the Hastings and it'll give you an entire section on it. Now, we don't believe in demons because Jesus said demons were self. Dave asked me this morning, he says, now you say, he says, you've said that daemonion and theos were interchangeable words. They were because a daemonion was a god and theos is the Greek word God. Now, they were interchangeable only to the pagans. Only to the pagans. The pagans would use theos sometime, and they would use daemonion, referring to their gods. Their gods was Hercules. Hercules was a demon. And so was Venus and Adonis and Aphrodite and Diana of the Ephesians. Every one of those Greek and Roman gods were called demons. When you look up the word daemonion in your, in your Strong's Concordance, it will say a deity. A deity is a god. To deify something means to make a god out of it. Now, if you believe in demons, you have to believe in other gods. You also have to believe in genies. You have to believe in genies. Genie comes from the word gene. Now, people think I make this up. When you do the thorough, in-depth study that I've done out of Hastings and McClinic and Strong and dozens of other books in my library at home, I've got all kinds of books on devils and demons, and all you have to do is go online and look up the word demon. Just go online. Look up demon. Now, they'll have a lot of error in it because demons are full of error. The fact that people believe they're real entities, that's erroneous. This is not true. Jesus said they were self. You have to keep remembering. <laughs> Let me read something to you here. List of ancient demon names. And it'll give you some of the names. Amon, Abaddon, Abalam, Abraxas, Adramalek goes on down here, uh, Apollyon. We know Apollyon was the god of the bottomless pit. Crone or Kronos, which was the horned one, and that's where the picture of Satan comes from. Incubus. They make movies about Incubus, don't they? Uh, Moloch, Medusa, Legion, Jinn. These are the names, and whoever some of these others are, Obazath, Nyai, Laura, Kidel. Now, where did they come up with these? They had to name these demons themselves. Shamael, Set. Set was one of the gods of darkness of the pagans. Zen, I'm sure we get Zen Buddhism out of that. Zemu, Zs, Yoki. You've got all kinds, but there's something on the front part of this, and this just comes off the Internet. The demon Baal, Baal. I like that. Baal or Baal was supposed to be a powerful, ancient, Judo-Christian demon. Baal was brought into Israel. Now, this is amazing. If this is a Mediterranean Sea, here's Israel right here. Here's Egypt down here. There's the Delta. Here's the... Sinai Peninsula, and this is what we call Lebanon right here, right above it, Lebanon. This is where Israel is getting a lot of tax from right here. They're being attacked by Lebanon. They're being attacked by Syria, which is right up here. 
and then you have Iraq over here, Iraq, and Iran over here. Iran is ancient Persia, and Iraq is ancient Babylon. And that's, here's Iraq right here in those red lines right there. And this is Persia or Iran from here over to India. Now, when Jezebel's father, who was the prince of Tyre, which is the same thing as Lebanon. Another name for this in the ancient world was Phoenicia. That was also what we call Lebanon. Now, Tyre... Tyre, and I want you to watch the connection here. Tyre and Sidon propagated the same fire worship as they had over here in Babylon. Here's the Euphrates. Here's the Tigris River. It propagated, and it was said that Ethbaal, which was the father of Jezebel, Ethbel means with Baal. It was said that he was the priest of Baal from Babylon, and he was the priest of the Ashtaroth, or Ashtoreth would be a singular, Ashtaroth would be plural. And this is, watch how this thing connects together. Now, he was a priest. So, the two systems, like I said last week, that kept the fire worship thriving in the world was Tyre, Sidon, and Babylon. Tyre and Sidon was just a child of Babylon. It was a daughter of Babylon. The cities were called daughters. The cities of a, the cities of a ruling mountain Empire, here's the capital city, here's the mountain, and this would have been a daughter of Babylon. That's why in, in Isaiah 14, when Belshazzar is destroyed, he is called Lucifer. That's the only time that means shining one because he kept the fire worship thriving. Then over here, Tyre and Sidon kept Baal worship. Baal comes out of Tyre and Sidon, and you can trace Baal back over here to, to Babylon. Baal was, was the Tyrian Hercules. And Baal's birthday, along with Hercules, would be December the 25th. All the sun god's birthday was December the 25th. But I want you to see something here. That when, when Jezebel married Ahab, she married this system of Baal and Grove. Grove is the tree goddess. You can see the Christmas tree in Jeremiah 10, Isaiah 44. And everywhere you find the word grove, that is the upright tree goddess. Now, where was I? Jezebel marries down into northern Israel. She meets, she meets Ahab somewhere at a party because he's right up there on the border of Tyre and Sidon, and somehow he runs across Jezebel, marries it down, and brings it down into Israel, and it's called Baal and Grove worship. Israel went after this system for 500 years. Baal and Grove are fire and tree worship, and later on that was brought to the church and renamed Christ's Mass. And we'll go through this as we go into this season, or Christmas, Christ's Mass. Now, let me read this to you, the demon Baal. Well, Baal was a demon because it comes out of Babylon. Revelation 17 and 5. Babylon is the mother. Birthed and nurtured, all idolatry came out of here. So everywhere you go into the world, all the male deities are fire gods, and all the female deities are tree goddesses. That's why when... That is exactly why when Elijah faces the priest of Baal on a mountain up on Mount Carmel up here in northern Israel, he faces off with the priest of Baal and he says to them, 
let the God that answers by fire, he didn't say it this way, but this is exactly what he meant. Let him be the fire God. He said, let him be God. Of course, God reached down and licked up the sacrifice of the altar and all the water that was poured around the trench. Baal was called a demon. Well, if, if it comes out of Babylon, certainly it was, because all of these were just types of the original prototype, and the prototype or the beginning type or the first type was Nimrod, who started Babylon. And he was an ancestor, and this is all ancestor worship. Now, I'm bringing out something here about Solomon. Let me read just a little bit about this. Baal was so supposed to be a powerful, ancient, Judeo-Christian demon. Well, he was. Wasn't he a god? He was an imaginary god, but he was a god of the ancient world. For this very reason, God destroyed Israel and scattered them all over the earth, and then they came back after 2,600 years in May of 1948. <clears throat> it was understood that he had the power to make people wise, speaking of Baal or Baal. Baal just, it's an old ancient word that means the Lord. They called their God the Lord. That's all it means. When you, you'll see names all through the Old Testament scripture that have B-E-L uh, or B-A-L on the end of the word, that means they were they would name their children Lord. It was understood that he had the power to make people wise. He also had the powers to make people invisible, those who invoked him. It is also learned that his powers rise to take a toll during the month of October. At the end of the harvest is October the 31st. Baal is said to have a hoarse and husky voice. He was also said to possess an army of 66 units under his sole command, going by the early depictions, his appearance was that of a man and an animal combination. I could go into that, but I won't do that right now. That's like going along with shape-shifting, changing yourself into an animal. It goes along with the cherubim of the Assyrians. Remember that? Now, now I want to read something to you about I have gone online, and I went online some time ago, and I've read and I've understood this for a long time, that Solomon, when you go into Islam, Solomon is one of the main characters in the Islamic religion and faith. He was considered one of the great prophets of the ancient world. And the let me show you where the tie and the connection comes from. It was said that Solomon was master of the demons by the Jews. Now, Je now, remember, daemonion means to distribute fortunes. Now, the, the Islamic people say that Solomon was master of the genies. Jews say Solomon was master of the demons. What the Jews call demons, the Arabs call genies. Genie comes from gene. And you get wishes from a genie, and a genie distributes fortunes. Now, I've gone online, and I've just looked up some things. Sometime back, I went, into, went online, and I looked up Solomon, the relationship of King Solomon and the genies. And this afternoon, I thought, well, I don't think I've looked up Solomon and the demons online. So I looked up Solomon and the demons. And I'd come up with all this information of Solomon and the demons. Let me read a, see what I can read here to you. Solomon and the demons. I've got some stuff I want to read, but I don't want to read all these long ones. Okay, this is written by Solomon and the demons. This is written by a Roman Catholic. Catholicism comes out of Babylonianism. So that would be a good place to start. The author of this is uh, Nazumel. He says, I, I like non-canonical -con -con Christian folklore, meaning folklore that's not in the Old or New Testament. 
Growing up as I did in a Catholic family, Bible stories never felt like myth in the same way, say, stories about Roman and Greek or Hindu pantheons. A pantheon meant the pantheon of the gods was a temple that had all the gods in it, like in Greece or in, they had a, a pantheon and that, you've seen the pictures of the pantheon in Greece. That's where all the gods lived. They lived on the mountain in the pantheon. Pantheon meant pan, means all of the gods. In fact, that, that roof that you see in the Vatican when the Pope sits at the Christmas Eve mass, that roof that's in there that's being held up by those swirling uh, trees, that roof come out of the pantheon of the gods in Greece in the Catholic, in St. Peter's Basilica. Now, let me just read a couple of things here. He says, the uh, Bible stories felt more like history. There are the stories I grew up with stories. I've always known from the inside, I didn't always appreciate the universe explaining myth-making capacity of the Judo-Christian tradition in the same way I appreciate it in traditions. Notice he's using this word tradition. That means something that has no foundation in truth that I didn't grow up in. Stories and tidbits like Six Foot Jesus and a very old Irish story, Moses and the Origin of Leprechauns. Notice they put leprechauns in here. Notice the, all of the interchanging of words. The story that I retell below of King Solomon and the demon, Ephippus, E-P-H-I-P-P-A-S, with a bit of backstory, is originally from the Testament of Solomon out of the Pseudepigrapha. I've got the Pseudepigrapha in my library <coughs> at home, all these different books. The text, which describes in the first person how King Solomon gained power over demons and forced them to build the temple. Now, that's what all these writers will tell you, that Solomon forced the demons, forced 72 demons to build the temple of God. Now, where in the world would that come from? I'll tell you what let's do. Let's look at the Bible and see where we might be able to tell. Go over to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. You have to read in between the lines to see where all of this imagination comes from. It is imagination. Demons are man's imagination. <coughs> let's go to 1 Kings and let's go back to the beginning of the book. So we can see, now God has come to Solomon. Solomon is made king in the first chapter of this book. David sets up Solomon king and then he dies. The Bible says that David said, I go the way of all the earth. I'm leaving this world. And then this is right after the death of David. And Solomon prays his prayer right before this. Look at the prayer he prays. In verse 29 of chapter 4, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. I've got to read something else before I read this. I'm sorry, I've got to back up to the third chapter. The Lord comes to Solomon and says, ask me anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And here's Solomon's words. Well, let me go ahead and read this whole prayer that Solomon prays. Verse 5 of chapter 3. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I will give you, Solomon. He's truly one of the wisest of men. Solomon wrote, he wrote, uh, Proverbs, he wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is about Christ and the church. It's about a man and his wife, but mainly Christ and the church. He wrote that when he was young. It's believed that he wrote Proverbs in his middle age, and he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes when he had really gotten wise to be an old man. He says that the last verse of the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, he said, as much wisdom, as much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increases sorrow. The older you get, the more grieved and more soft you are about life when you're a believer. 
And he said, everything is vanity and vexation of spirit. The word vexation means to grab for the wind. Now, here's what he asked God. God gave Solomon wisdom. Well, what did I admit? Wait a minute. He says, 26. Solomon. Wait a minute. Where am I looking at? I'm looking at the wrong thing. Six. Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he has walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart. With thee and thou hast kept for him the, his great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And that's me. That's what he's saying. You've given David a son to sit on the throne, and I'm the one you've given it to. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. I am but a child. Solomon was very humble at this point. I'm just a child. I know not how to go out or come in, Lord. I don't know what I'm doing. Help me. Now, this is a prayer that we need to ask. And thy servant is in the midst of the people which thou hast chosen. I'm in the middle of Israel, and I'm just a child when it comes to understanding and wisdom. <clears throat> a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Here's what you, you say you'll give me. Here's what I want. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart. Well, that's a prayer we need to pray, isn't it? God will answer that prayer. He won't give me a new Cadillac, but he'll give you an understanding heart if you've humbled yourself to him. To judge thy people that I may discern between good and, good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing, and God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither have you asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself, understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. I've already given you wisdom. It's in your mind, in your experience, you will learn to understand the wisdom that I've given you. Lo, I have given unto thee a wise and understanding heart. You've already got that, Solomon so that there was none like, thee, be, none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any rise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among kings like unto thee in all the days that you live. Nobody will be as wise as Solomon. And you'll have all the riches in the world, and you'll be the richest king Wait a minute. I think God is beginning to distribute fortunes, isn't he? He certainly is. Is it Satan that distributes fortunes? No, it is Satan that lies about distributing fortunes. It's God that does that. It's not a demon that distributes fortunes. The doctrine of distributing fortunes is what men preach. When Kenneth Copeland preaches, God wants you rich. You send your money to me, and God will make you rich. No, that will make you rich, you liar. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk when I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all the servants. And then these two women come to him and say, well, this is my baby. And the other says, it's my baby. And Solomon says, I'll tell you what we'll do. Cut the baby in half, and each of you can take half. And the mother says, no, give her the baby in Solomon. She, and the woman, the other one says, yes, we'll split the baby in two. And God says, give it to the woman who wants to give the baby up to spare its life. She's the mother. He was wise. Now, go over here to the, we're talking about Solomon and the genies and Solomon being master of the demons among the Jews and master of the genies among the, among the Arabs or the Islamic people. Chapter 4, verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom 
excel the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. And he was wiser than all the men, than Ethan, the Ezraite, and Heman, and Kalko, and Darda, and the sons of Mahol. And his fame was all over the nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a 1,005. So he had a lot of Proverbs that's not printed. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon. Now that's where he's going to get his, remember? They said Solomon employed 72 demons to build the temple in Israel. Who did he employ to do that? You've heard of the cedars of Lebanon. They got their trees from Lebanon. What was in Lebanon? Fire worship, tree worship. How about, what if I said demons were in Lebanon? Not, not what churches call demons. Let's continue reading here. He spake of the trees of the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall, he spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth, which had heard his wisdom. Now read chapter 5, verse 1. And Hiram, king of Tyre. Hiram, king of Tyre. Now Hiram is a central character in, character in the Masonic Lodge. You know that, don't you? He is the chief architect of masonry. Well, Hiram wasn't a Christian. Solomon was hiring Hiram to build a temple. In all probability, where they come up with this, Solomon employed 72 demons to build the temple. That was fire worship up there in Tyre. And he recruited men to cut trees out of Lebanon and bring them down to build the temple in Jerusalem and employed these demons, these evil men, these fire worshipers. Look, and Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard they had known him king in the room of his father, for Hiram was ever a lover of David, but he was a fire worshiper. He was a nice neighbor next door. And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how that David my father could not build an house unto the name of the Lord, because he was a bloody man, a man of war. That's why God said, David, you can't build it. Your son Solomon will build the temple. And we're going into the building of the temple at this point. And God's given the commission to build the temple. And guess who's going to help do this? The Tyrian workman where the demon system is thriving alive and well. And when you go into all of this mythology, it will tell you, did Solomon build the original temple by enslaving demons? I believe this is exactly where they got it. Now, let me continue reading here. <laughs> what verse was I in? Uh, three. Three. Thou knowest how that David my father could not build a house unto the name of the Lord his God for wars which was about him on every side. In 2 Samuel 7 and 5, God, well, look over there, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 7. Look at 4. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, who was the prophet who had condemned David for having had adulterous affair with Bathsheba and murdering Uriah the Hittite, her husband, that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house, built me a house for it to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day have, but have walked in a tent in the tabernacle and in all places wherein I have walked with all the children of 
Israel spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build you not me a house of cedar? Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat. You were a shepherd. I called you in by Samuel in the 16th chapter of First Samuel. From following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel, I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all mine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and they may dwell in a place of their own, and have no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time, and as since that time I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest all thine enemies also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house, and when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which will be Solomon, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish this kingdom, and he shall build an house in my name, and I will establish the throne of thy kingdom forever, and I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and he shall commit a nick. He shall, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of the people. He goes on to say that, David, you're a bloody man and you can't build my house. Solomon will do this. Now go back over here to chapter 5. What verse was I in there? 3, 4. Now, but now the Lord my God, this is chapter 5, verse 4, 1 Kings. And now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. And behold, I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon the throne in thy room, he shall build and house unto my name. He's going to build a house, and it's going to be the temple, and it's going to be an exact replica of the tabernacle out in the wilderness, and that temple is us now. Now, therefore, I command thou that thou hew me clear trees of Lebanon, of Tyre. That's where they're going to come from. And my servants shall be with thy servants unto thee will I give hire for thy servants, according to all that thou shalt appoint. I'll have you hire men of Tyre. I believe this is where they've twisted these verses, and they've twisted history and said that 72 demons, since it was a seat of fire worship, built the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now you've got all this mythology mixed up with biblical history, and people don't even know where it came from. The fire worship started in Babylon. That's the mother of all idolatry, and that's where demons were born. The sun god, the sun god, the sun wanes down to December the 21st, the winter solstice, and the pagans thought the sun was burning out because it's the longest nights of the year, so they set a birthday on December the 25th for all the sun gods of the Babylonian system, wherever they are in the world, and all the male deities were fire gods. Fire represented the sun upon the earth, and that's where the Christ mass comes from. So he goes on to say, I will give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. This is in verse 6. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber. We don't have any good skilled men to hew timber to build the temple of God. So we're going to hire these demons. These fire worshipers out of Tyre. It's amazing how you can go in here on the internet. Solomon and the demons. Did King Solomon build the original temple by enslaving demons? This is just nothing but a convolution of the truth of the Bible. This goes into the jinn. King Solomon and demons here. He talks about Asmodeus, which is a demon that Solomon employed to build the temple. Just, I mean, it's ridiculous. 
all the things that they're saying. All of this is just stuff I pulled off. You can get this off the internet or you can get out of books. You can get it out of the pseudepigrapha. Well, let's continue reading here. Verse 7. And it came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon, Hiram is the king of Tyre, one of the headquarters for fire worship. Two men equated with Satan himself, the prince of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, and Belshazzar, the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14, and Belshazzar's called Lucifer, the shining one. Amazing, isn't it? What's really amazing, give me another pen here. I think that's about out. This same system, when, when, Cyrus, when Cyrus conquered Babylon, and Cyrus is the king of Persia, or we'd call it Iran, and he comes over here and diverts the Euphrates River out into the, out into the Arabian Desert. Babylon had walls that were nearly 400 feet high and had a they had dug them like 375 to 400 feet deep for the river to run around and they ran the river the Euphrates River around and through Babylon Babylon was built on sand Remember the man that built his house? They had a seven-tier bridge that went across. You could walk across the this side of Babylon. And they said, we can't be conquered. We got all this river flowing around us. And we got it flowing through us. And, and Cyrus diverts the river, goes upstream, diverts it out into the desert, and he marches down the riverbed, comes up to these two-leaf gates, marches in. There's Belshazzar, Lucifer, parting with the vessels of the house of the Lord that had been carried away about 140 years before by Nebuchadnezzar. Let me finish reading this. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, well, let me read 7 again. And it came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, which hath given unto David a wise son over his great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which thou sendest me for. I will do all thy desire concerning timber of cedar. This is a fire worshiper or a demon worshiper that's going to hew timbers because Israel didn't have workmen that, they didn't have men that were skilled enough in it. So they're going to have demons do this. Demons are not real they're just self and the head of the demon worship was babylon tyre the two systems and what i started to say what's amazing when cyrus comes down the river when he comes in and conquers babylon he throws out the chaldean system the chaldeans were the magicians of babylon or they were the wise men of Babylon, or the M-A-G-I-I, -I, or Magos. Magos is singular, Magi is plural, and that's the wise men. They were the Magi of Babylon, but they had righteous wise men and unrighteous wise men in Babylon. Well, the ones that came to see Jesus were the righteous wise men that studied the stars, and the other unrighteous ones worshipped the stars. So they found their seat in they relocated in Pergamos. Pergamos is up here on the northwestern end of Turkey. And when you look at Revelation, the second chapter, it's, you can trace. You, well, let me go ahead and do this. The chief fire god in Pergamos was A-E-S-C-U. P A L I U S. Osculopius was the serpent god, and he had he had behind his head the sun rays or the halo or the sun god. And he had well, I'll go ahead and say that in a minute. When this system was driven out of Babylon, it found 
a new place in Pergamos, and that's why the Bible says in Revelation, the second chapter, Revelation 2, John is writing to the seven churches of Asia. Pergamos is one of them. There were more than seven churches in Asia. You had the church of Troas. You had the church of Colossia. They, he didn't write to them, but the letters were to them just like they're to us. And he says here, verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. This is Revelation 2. I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. The seat of Satan found its place in Pergamos. On the western end, northwestern end of what we call Turkey, they called it Asia Minor. <laughs> even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied the faith, even in those days wherein Antipas... Evidently, there was a man there named Antipas who was the faithful martyr of God, of Christ, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. The fire worship found its way to Pergamos. Then when the king of Pergamos, the king of Pergamos was a man called Atalus. We probably get the name Italy from that. I would, if I took a guess from Atalus, because when Italus died, they quit calling these Chaldeans and they started calling them Etruscans. And, the, and Rome over here loved the Etruscan magic system. The Chaldeans, one who had mastered magic down here in Babylon. Magic means the science of the Magi. That's what it means. So they had mastered magic, and the Romans liked the magic, except when they used the magic or sleight of hand, they were claiming to be gods and doing some magnificent, miraculous thing. They were fooling the people. It's just like whenever they would talk to the, the familiar spirits or to their kin folks. Familiar spirits is the word ob, it means bottle. And they would talk to the bottle, and it was, a bottle was a goat skin. They made their bottles out of goat skins, actually goat stomachs. They would sew in, after they dried it, they'd sew up one end, and they would speak ventriloquistically, if you call it that a word. They'd speak like ventriloquists and peep and mutter and talk like this and be pretending to be talking to the dead. And necromancy is talking to the dead, and God says, you talk to the dead, you die. Were they talking to the dead? No. They were pretending to talk to the dead. Just like these guys on TV, ignoramuses. Now, it found its way up to Pergamos. That's what that's talking about in Revelation. When it found its way to Rome, Italus III left his system to the Roman Empire. They bring it into the temple of Mithra. Mithra's birthday is December the 25th. Gosh, that's not hard. Let me see here. Let me get the M volume. I like these up here because I can pull them out. Mithras. This is McClinic and Strong. You look up Mithra. M-I-T-H. Mithra had a tall white pointed cap on. All right. S T. Here it is. There's Mithra. Right there. Mithra. The ancient monuments present him as a beautiful youth dressed in Phrygian garb, kneeling upon an ox into whose neck he plunges a knife. That's the takeoff on Nimrod. Nimrod was said to slay the great bull and put the horns on his head. It was because he was a hero, a male deer. That's why they wear the deer skin across them. The guy who's the strong guy, it was said that he killed the great deer with his hands. Sometimes it is the, he killed the great swine or the deer with his hands. And, he, and to be proud... 
he said, let us make us a name. He puts the horns on his head, ties the tail around his waist, and ties the hooves around his feet so he can say, see how great I am? And you get that. That's the American Indian where the horns on her head and the Vikings with the horns on their head. It all goes back to Babylon. Babylon mothered it all. Let me read the rest of this. Allegorically, emblems of the sun, of the sun, of the sun, and his course surrounding the group. At times, Mithra is also represented as a lion or the head of a lion. The most important of his festivals was his birthday celebrated on December the 25th. He was a sun god. The day subsequently fixed against all evidence, against all evidence as the birthday of Christ. Now, deal with that. I like those. I can just go over and pick them up and flip over it, and here we are. Now, so when it moved to Pergamos, it ended up in Rome in the Temple of Mithra, and they had the Vestal Virgins. Anybody named their daughter Vestal has got to be nuts. Vestal Goodman. Good grief. The Vestal Virgins' job, one of their main jobs, was to keep the flame the eternal fire burning in the temple of Mithra because it burned continually over here in the temple of Osculopius and it burned continually in Babylon and they took an Olympic torch, they took a torch and carried it by one man and took the fire out of the temple of Osculopius over here in what we call Turkey or Asia Minor, ran it by torch over to Mithra's, Mithra's temple and they kept it, the flame burning. And then later on, Roman Catholicism picked it up and brought it to America. And you got an eternal flame burning at the foot of John Kennedy's grave. And this is a, it's more or less a convolution of God says, you want eternal fire, I'll give you eternal flame. You can trace from John Kennedy's grave and anywhere else they have eternal flames burning, back to Rome, back to the Etruscans, which were the Chaldeans from, from Pergamos, back to Babylon, over here. This is the Mass, the Christ Mass, and you can trace it all the way back to Tyre and Sidon marrying it down into Israel, is there any wonder that God destroyed Israel for doing that for 500 years? Uh, it's also the flaming cross, that's right. They worshipped a flaming cross on Lady Day in the ancient world. Now, where was I? I was in 1 Kings 5. 5, 8. Hiram said to Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which thou sentest me for. I will do all thy desire concerning timber of cedar, concerning timber of fir. The demon system is certainly going to help build the temple of Solomon, isn't it? And they come up with all this information. I've heard about this for years, Solomon and the demons, Solomon and the genies. And concerning timber of fir, my servants shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea, and I will convey them by sea and floats unto the place that thou shalt appoint me and will cause them to be discharged there. And thou shalt receive them and thou shalt accompany my, accomplish my desire in giving food for my household. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all of his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household and 20 measures of pure all thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year, and the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and they, they two made a league together, but it didn't convert Hiram. He was still king of the fire worship system. And later on, Ahab is going to marry that system. He's going to run across this witch, Jezebel, and he's going to marry it down into Israel. Solomon was master of the genies among the Islamic people. He was master of the demons among the Jews. I've mentioned this before in 
I think it was, who was it sent this to me? Grafsky? This is an old movie out of the 60s. I saw it in the 60s. It's called The Brass Bottle. It's just a movie, a real simple little comedy, nothing serious about it. What's so funny is the man who made this movie knew what I was saying up here. It stars uh, Tony Randall, Barbara Eden, and Burl Ives. And Burl Ives is a genie in here, and uh, he is the genie. He's called Fakrosh, good, nice genie-sounding name. And all through the movie, of course, Tony Randall finds the genie in the bottle, opens it up, and out pops this great big guy. Well, they, they came up with I Dream of Genie out of this movie, and it was Barbara Eden that starred as the genie in the movie, but Burl Ives is the genie. And all through the movie, he is saying, he's talking about Solomon and the blue gin, Solomon and the red gin. He'd say Solomon. They pronounced it S-O-L-Y-M-O-N, Solomon. He kept saying Solomon and the blue gin, Solomon and the red gin. He would say that through the movie. The point I'm getting at, they did more. Now, this is just a little cheap movie. It's not some great theological work, and it's not some documentary. It's just a movie. It's a simple movie with no cussing. You can watch it, and it's, it's out of the 60s, mid-60s. I saw it when it first came out. And when I started teaching on this, and I began to study Solomon, and they said Solomon and the genies, I immediately, boom, my mind went back to that. I mentioned it on, I mentioned it, and... Uh, John Grafsky sent it to me. And it makes me know that even in Hollywood, they know more than the Baptist preachers know about Solomon and the genies. Well, that's the truth. Let me show you why I believe he's head of the genies, okay? Huh? Get my shirt, okay. I want you to turn over to first. Now, this is really amazing. Solomon prays to God, give me wisdom. And that's in the third chapter. He starts building the temple here. Look at verse 18 of chapter 5. And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders did hew them and the stone squares, so they prepared timber and stones to build a house. Now, he starts building the temple of God, and he finishes it up in chapter 9. And then, chapter 11, Solomon gets crazy. Huh? What? Solomon! All of the world is worshiping fire and tree gods. The only people in the world worshiping Jehovah God is Israel. No one else, they're not allowed the word of God. They don't get the word of God until Acts 2, when God pours out of his spirit on all flesh, red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh. Look here in chapter 11. Here's why I believe he's master of the genies, master of the demons. What are the demons? The fire and tree worship. Who was doing that all of the world? Now look here. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Don't mean weird women. No Cree, N-O-K-R-I-Y. Foreign. Why was... <coughs> he loved all these women. Why? Solomon started making his mistake here. What did God say he would do if we were obedient to him? He said, you'll conquer your enemies. You will, you'll go against your enemy one way. They'll flee seven ways. All you have to do is be obedient to me. Solomon somehow forgot this, just like David, his father. Solomon loved many strange women. Some will say, and this is the truth, they would, when two men were, when two kingdoms were at each other's throat, constantly warring, like the Ptolemies of Egypt. Remember when Alexander the Great conquered the world, the, Alexander the Great's empire was divided between four generals when he died. He died in Babylon. He liked Babylon. It was pretty. It was beautiful. All the hanging gardens and all the river flowing through it. 
When he died, Lysacomus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus divided his kingdom up. So in order, to, in the Seleucians, Syria, was always attacking the Ptolemies. You can see that in the 11th chapter of Daniel. They were always attacking them back and forth. So in order to bring about peace, the Syrian Seleucian kings gave one of their daughters to Egypt. Her name was Cleopatra. Cleopatra was not an Egyptian. She was a Seleucian, a Syrian. They would do that to form alliances in order to have peace. This is in all probability what Solomon was doing, unless he just couldn't, unless he just loved women too much. Well, I guess if you had as many as he had, you might too. No, you wouldn't, but most men would. <laughs> Together with the daughter of Pharaoh. He married Pharaoh's daughter, and she worshipped Isis and Osiris and Amun Ra and all the gods of Egypt, which were fire gods, which were demon gods, weren't they? And Solomon's going to be their master, isn't he? Women of Moabites, they worship Shemash, the sun god in Moab. Ammonites, they worship Molech, the sun god among the Ammonites. That's northern Jordan. Moab is southern Jordan. Edomites, that's just below the Dead Sea. That is the descendants of Esau. They're none of them believers. They all worship sun and tree goddesses. Zidonians, Sidon, Baal and Grove and all the rest of that. And the Hittites, who were pagans that lived in the land, and they were sun and tree worshipers. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart for after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in phileo. <laughs> he liked them. I don't believe he had an agape for them. They may have translated that agape, but I don't believe it. I don't know what they translated it. Willie can tell us on his Septuagint there. If they translated to agape in the Septuagint, I believe he liked them. He had lusted after them. And he had 700 wives princes, and 300 combines. <laughs> 300 concubines. That was secondary wives. He had a thousand wives and he couldn't fill all his sexual desires with a thousand women because he said your vanity and vexation of spirit. And they were all sun and tree worshipers. They were demon worshipers. The gods of the pagan world were called daemonion or demons. This is what I believe, where I believe this comes from, Solomon being the master of the demons, master of the genies. Genie comes from gene. That's your ancestors. It's all ancestor worship. Totem means ancestor, mean kin folks. Huh? Fellows. Well, I, I figured that. I didn't even have to go to the Septuagint. He had a, he had a philos, a fondness for them. It comes from phileo. He liked them. He lusted after them. He didn't have a godly love towards them. His wives turned away his heart. You mean a man this wise and you think you're smart enough to put up with an unbelieving woman? No siree. Ain't nobody, ain't no man that smart. You know what I'm telling you? You better be. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. His heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, a demon goddess, a genie, where he could get his wishes. Ashtaroth comes from Ashtaroth. Aster is the Greek word star. They were all deified in the stars, weren't they? And that's what they worshipped over here at Babylon. You know what this is? 
This is just a mixture of demons and Christmas tonight. It's just a, it's just a cross section of both of them. <clears throat> For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of Sidon. Well, the goddesses of Sidon was groves, was tree goddesses. And after Milcom, the abomination, Milcom is a variation of Malcolm or Molech or Moloch. They're all variations of the same word. Of the Ammonites, here's Ammon, northern Jordan, Moab, southern Jordan, Lebanon, Tyre, and Sidon, and Egypt. Boy, Israel is surrounded by this stuff, isn't it? And that's why it bled in there and they went after it. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Shemosh, the god, the sun god of Moab. What? How could he do this when he's saying, give thy servant an understanding heart there in chapter 3? God said, I'll give you wisdom. If you ever sin, I'll deal with you. And he did. You say, I wouldn't do that. You wouldn't. Are you sure? You know, I believe that every person living is capable of any sin they've ever seen or heard of. If God will pull his restraining hand off you and, and, and subject you to certain temptations, you don't have any idea how wicked your heart can be. I found that out about me. The abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon, and likewise did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, I guess so. Solomon's story is one of the most mystifying things I've ever seen. Because he, his heart turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him <laughs> twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. <clears throat> Why didn't God just kill him and send him to hell? Well, mercy. Yeah, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. I will have compassion on my people. Why didn't he send Manasseh, the king of Israel, to hell? I would have thought he'd have done that because he passed his children to the fire and worshiped all these gods and raised up a tree goddess in the temple of God and did more evil than all the kings before him, even more than Solomon. And he was a believer, and he repented when he was carried away to Babylon. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it unto your servant... I'm going to take the kingdom away and give it to Joseph. He gives it to Joseph through his second-born son, Ephraim, who commands northern Israel in the next couple of chapters when God causes Rehoboam, the son of David, to take some bad advice from his high school buddies. And they say, you tell these people you're king of Israel. When they come to him and said, your father Solomon... He chastised us with stripes. He said, you tell them you'll chastise them with scorpions. What he meant, what was meant by that text was Solomon had taxed the people to death to build the temple. And his buddies came to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, and said, why don't you just tell them you're king? You're young and you're the boss now. It don't matter what anybody thinks. And that's what he said to the men of Israel and the ten northern tribes took off north under the commanding general Jeroboam. Just because Oboam is the same as Oboam over here, they weren't brothers. He was the commanding general of Israel, and he takes the ten northern tribes north, and the kingdom splits over Solomon being the master of the demons. Now, let me read the rest of this here. He says, I will rend the kingdom from thee. What does he mean, rend the kingdom from him? Well, what does that mean? Did all the kingdom leave? Gosh, somebody washed this with the wrong stuff. With water. 
All right. What does he mean, I'll rend the kingdom? Rend. I'm going to take the kingdom away from you. Does he take all the tribes out of, away from, away from Solomon? No. Rend kingdom. Well, Jeroboam ends up with northern Israel. And with northern Israel, Rehoboam, Jeroboam ends up with northern Israel. And Solomon, uh, Solomon, Rehoboam, ends up with southern Judah, which is comprised of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Southern Judah is southern Israel, Judah and Benjamin. What does God mean he took the kingdom from Rehoboam or to, from Solomon or from Rehoboam his son? Because he's got two tribes. He's got part of the kingdom, doesn't he? Huh? Does anybody know the answer to this? Huh? That's right. Ephraim had the inheritance of Israel. What what book is that in? What book does Ephraim get the inheritance? Genesis what? Huh? Forty eight. When Jacob puts puts his right hand, he crosses his hand, and he puts his right hand on the head of Ephraim in his left hand upon the head of the firstborn Manasseh. And Joseph says, don't do that, father. Manasseh is my firstborn. He said, I know that, my son. The secondborn is going to get the blessing. Ephraim headed up. He had, Ephraim is northern Israel. And he, his, his tribe was head of the northern tribes of northern Israel. So the inheritance the inheritance is in northern Israel, and the king is in southern Judah, isn't he? The king will come out of Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah. So the king is out of Judah. They split at the end of time, according to 37, Ezekiel 37. And Isaiah 11 the two nations will become one at the end of time. Well, they are now. So when he says, I will take the kingdom from you and I'll give it to your neighbor, Jeroboam, the commander. Now, the true lineage of God is David. Saul was of the wrong tribe. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. So God had to put an evil heart in him so he could turn away from him because it was the people's idea to have a king when Saul came along and David is the tribe of Judah, Solomon, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa. These are father, son, 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 son. Athaliah, daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, marries Jehoram because Jehoshaphat is always running around with Ahab. Wrong thing to do, even though Jehoshaphat's a good man, except he don't know who to run with and who not to. And so Athaliah marries Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram, when Jehoram dies and then Ahaziah dies, she says, I'm taking the king for myself. And she kills all of the seed royal, all the descendants of Jehoshaphat. Everybody, except for one, Joash. And then the high priest comes out and says, kill that witch right now. And they do. And her day is over. And then all the way to the end of the kingdom, these are all descendants of David. This is the... This is southern Israel, southern Judah. This is the only righteous, divine right of kings right here. It's not in England. This is the divine right of kings right here. Whoever can muster an army together and overthrow the existing king of northern Israel, you get to be king of northern Israel. If you can be tough enough or assassinate somebody or kill your brother who's king and take over, you can take over northern Israel. But southern Judah is... The kingdom, northern Israel, is the is the uh, inheritance. Now, 
<clears throat> he doesn't do it in Solomon's day, does it, when his son Rehoboam is king. Now, let's go over to, here's another reason I believe that Solomon is master of the demons. Demon means to distribute fortunes, doesn't it? Let's go to Ecclesiastes. What does demon mean? It means to distribute the fortunes of the world. He was not only master of the women who worshipped the demons in his land and got him to worship him, the demons. He was master of money. He had more money than anybody else. The temple was made of gold, gold-plated. All of his castle was made of gold-plated. It was, he had everything. And he says here, look here in Ecclesiastes. Let me read a little bit of the previous chapter of, of chapter one. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now, some people have tried to argue that Ecclesiastes wasn't written by Solomon. And it was written by one of these other kings. And I doubt if it was written by one of these other kings. I believe it's Solomon. I was preacher, king over Israel and Jerusalem. I gave my heart to seek and search out wisdom, first of all. That was the beginning of my... Uh, Ecclesiastes 1, verse 12 and 13. I'll read Ecclesiastes 1, 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem... Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, he had everything. And he's saying, everything I've ever had is vanity. Wasn't worth anything. Vanity is the word hebel, H-E-B-E-L. It means worthless. Worthless. That's, it's all worthless. What profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under, sun, under the sun? Under the sun, every time he mentions under the sun, he's talking about where the sun shines on the earth. Of all the things that you're doing on the earth, where's the profit in it? Let me tell you where it is. One generation passeth away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. And the sun still shines, and the sun also rises. That's what, what's his name said? Uh, Hemingway. Yeah, sun also rises. I think Solomon said it first. And the sun goeth down and hasteneth to his place where he arose. And it keeps happening over and over and over. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth it unto the north. It whirleth about continually. And the wind returneth again according to his circuits. And your life is going to be the same thing over and over and over. When somebody says to me, well, how are you doing today? I said, same th as it was yesterday and the day before and the day before. And I said, it has to get boring along the way, and I'll be bored from one day to the next, and then one day I'll die. Say that to somebody next time they say that, and watch them go, Oop. <laughs> I use how you doing today, I use that as a way to witness to people. When I say, and then I have to die and go into eternity, and I'll guarantee you won't get a comment. I've done that several times. He's saying, you know what he's saying here? Same thing, different day. That's what he's saying. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under their place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again, and it starts the cycle over and over and over and over. He's saying, what profit is there under the sun when everything just stays the same every day and you're going to get up tomorrow morning, you're going to go to work, you're going to take a shower, you're going to do this, do that, and you're going to come home and cook supper and wonder where am I going as a believer. The world doesn't wor wonder where they're going. All things are full of labor. He's telling you what you do under the sun in this verse. The eye it cannot, the man, man cannot utter What's going on? He won't simply say it with his mouth. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor are the ear filled with hearing. All things are full of labor. What you put in your eyes and your ears, your body's going to labor to fulfill. So watch out what you listen to. Let your eye be single and your ear be single. 
he's saying, whatever you look at, remember the word idolatry, idololatria, comes from ido and latruo. Ido means to see, latruo means to serve. It means to serve what you put in your eyes and your ears, and that's what you're going to do. If you go down there and look at new cars every Sunday, Sunday afternoon, cars you can't afford, you're eventually going to get another job and work your brains out and try to get it. And it'll be futile, and you'll waste your time away working for stuff. The thing that hath been, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. What has been in the mind of God from forever, it will be. It's because we're in a circuit. Everything is in a it's going through this same circuit, and you'll get up tomorrow. If you live for anything that's profitable, it'll have to be the Lord because your life is, believe this or not, your life is not going to get real interesting as you get older. It doesn't happen. Boy, it seems to make life something serious about it, isn't it? I'm here to testify to you that when you get in your 70s, it's not any more interesting in your 70s than it was at 25. It's more interesting at 25 as far as worldly things concerned. But you can't get fulfilled. And you go out there and keep trying to do it, and you keep trying to grab for the wind. The only thing worth living for is Christ. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? Do you actually think New York is new? New York has been there ever since the world's been standing. It's been in the ground and unrefined metal, but it's been there. And it's been in the mind of God, hasn't it? There's nothing new under the sun. Everything that's out there has always been there. We just learn how to remold it, put it in a furnace and mold some metal and put together a car. Is there anything whereof it may be said? See, this is new. It hath already, it hath been already of old time, which was before us. It's just in a circle. It's going in a circle. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. We were in the restaurant today, and, and this waitress waited on us, and I was pointing up to a poster up there, giving her some trivia, and it was a poster of, of uh, an old movie, and the guy playing it was Kent Taylor. It's in the Cracker Barrel over there. And I said, see that guy, Kent Taylor? She said, yeah. I said, let me give you some trivia. She said, okay. I said, Republic Pictures made all these real cheap movies back in the 30s and 40s, Roy Rogers and Gene Autry and stuff like that. And they made this with this guy, Kent Taylor. And I said, they were grooming him to be another Clark Gable. She said, who's Clark Gable? <laughs> I went, who's Clark Gable? I said, well, he's the most famous movie star of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the, the king of Hollywood. Mary said, he played and gone to the wind. Oh, yeah, that guy. Oh. You know, <laughs> so... You, whatever, it's just we're going in a circuit, in a circle. And I said, well, Kent Taylor was going to be groomed to be another Clark Gable, and he never did make it over the hump. He was real good looking. He had this super personality, and he was real cool like James Bond. And uh, I said he never made it. So the guy who wrote Superman in 1939, the year I was born, I said he, he took Clark Gable and Kent Taylor, put their names together, and came up with Clark Kent. But nobody knows who Kent Taylor is. <laughs> and he played Boston Blackie on TV back in the early 50s, and he was the most famous TV detective. But the point is, it's all forgotten when it's over. She didn't know who Clark Gable was and didn't even care. Well, yeah, I think I know him. I think that guy had gone to win. Yeah. All right. Neither shall there be remembrance of things that are to come. Fame is 
fleeting and it's going to be gone and so's money and so's everything else and he's an old man and he's going to lose it all very shortly those that shall come after i the preacher was king over israel and jerusalem i gave my heart to seek and search out wisdom concerning all things that are done under the sun this sore travail hath god given to sons of men to be exercised therewith we are in sore travail seeking the things of the world. And it never happens. Whatever does happen, you don't care about it when it does. I have seen all the works that are under the sun, that are done under the sun. Behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Ruach. Vexation means to... This, this word rueth, R-E-U-W-T-H, is the word vexation. R-E-U-W-T-H, it means to grasp for the wind. It means to grasp for the wind. You can't get a hold of the wind. That's all that this going out and seeking to distribute fortunes is. It's grabbing for nothing, for air. Old people know that. Young people are going to learn it. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting, or there's a deficiency, cannot be numbered. I came in with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate. I've got everything, Solomon said. I have distributed fortunes to me, and I have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this is also vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and that's true. The wiser you get, the more grieved you are. I am a very grieved man. I grieve every day over a world that claims to believe God, and they don't. The Baptists, the Church of Christ, the Pentecostals, the Charismatics. They're all lying. And he that increaseth knowledge increases sorrow. The more this book you learn, the more sorrow you're going to be in the world. And you're going to say, I have a desire to part and be with Christ, which is better than this. There's got to be something better than this. This has proved to me to be the only thing in this existence that's worth living for is Christ. I have learned that. The world is not worth living in. Without Jesus, I'd rather be dead. And then he says, I said in mine heart, come now, I will prove thee with mirth. I'm going to put you through all of this fun. That's actually what mirth means, some ka. Just means to attempt to try to have all this fun. Distribute fortunes, therefore enjoy pleasure. Behold, this also is vanity. I said to myself, enjoy everything you can. Distribute fortunes. You're the richest man in the world. And I said of laughter, it's mad. It's foolishness. It's folly. When you start laughing, it's temporary, and you have to come back and face the truth. That's why comedians, most comedians in the, Show business world are very sad people. I've worked with some of them. They can't face reality, so they put on this front all the time to make people laugh. They don't want to face the truth. That's why so many of them commit suicide out there in Hollywood. Well, not just him, but all the rest of them. What's his name? The Spanish guy shot himself in the head. Uh, his son is an actor. No. Freddie Prince. Freddie Prince. Freddie Prince. I said, of laughter, it's mad, and of mirth, what, what good is it doing? What doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine and drink all I wanted, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom to lay hold on folly, silliness, foolishness till I might see what was that good for the sons of men. 
I wanted to find out what sons of men would be good for him. A man that was born upon the earth, which they should do under the heaven all the days of his life. I made me great works. I distributed great works for myself, all kinds of buildings, beautiful things. I builded me plenty of houses everywhere. I had a summer house, a winter house. I had a vacation home. I did everything I wanted. I planted me vineyards. Can you see why Solomon is master of the demons? The master of distributing fortunes. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I had every kind of fruit you can imagine. I made me pools of water. I had all my swimming pools. Uh, I don't know if he had concrete. I'm quite sure he did. Some kind of marble or something. He could afford it. To water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. Nobody had more wealth than me and had any reason to be happier than me when it came to worldly wealth. I distributed fortunes. I was master of the demons. I gathered them. Gathered me also silver and gold and peculiar treasures of kings in the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men. Everything that a man liked in the flesh. I got it. As musical instruments and that all of sorts. And I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. And also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I didn't keep anything from what I wanted that I looked at. Women, things, stuff, gold, silver, food, anything, I took it. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was the portion of my labor. Then I looked at all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that had labored to do, and behold, Everything was vanity and vexation of spirit. If you think you're trying to accomplish something, he's already done it. He's trying to tell us it's worthless. Outside of Christ, there's not anything worth having. I'm here to tell you at 74, the journey's been hard bringing me to this point. I've learned to be content in whatsoever state I'm in. The wiser you get, the more grieved you get, the more sorrowful you get. I'm a wise old man, and I'm grieved, and I'm sorrowful. Wisdom is not something you brag on. You say it's made me miserable. But this gospel is the most wonderful, miserable thing to live by. Because if you're in the world and you think, I'm going to find happiness with women, money, things, new cars, stuff, you won't. Why do you think those people in Hollywood that make 20 and $30 million a picture trade wives ever six weeks? Oh, I liked her when it started. Oh, yeah, I like her. I like him. They grow old. They've been through 10 wives, and they end up losing all their looks like Liz Taylor did. She was beautiful in the 50s. She looked like an old hag running in that wheelchair and she'd had so many facelifts that she got to looking like Plastic Man or something, you know. No matter how beautiful you are, you're going to lose it. No matter how handsome you are, you're going to lose it. That's everybody. Yeah, sure will. 18. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. Whenever Bill Gates dies, he don't get to keep his money. He gets to leave it behind. When J. Paul Getty died, I told this girl this afternoon, I said, I'm sure you never heard of J. Paul Getty. She said, no. I said, he was the richest man in America in the 60s. It's worth several billion dollars, which was equated to 50 billion today, I guess. And he was such an ornery, mean man. He put payphones in his humongous mansion in 
And and phone calls were only a dime back then. They were nickel in the 50s. But he put pay phones in his mansion so his servants couldn't bum phone calls off of him, and he's worth billions. He was very unhappy. He told the story about John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller had stressed out so much, his stomach was perforated with ulcers, and J. Paul Getty told the story. He said he could only eat crackers and milk. That's all he could eat. That's what Solomon says. He said a man works for all that he has, and he says, and he can't even eat of what he has. Look here in chapter 6, verse 1. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he doesn't want for anything for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not power to eat of what he's made. Sounds just like John D. Rockefeller. But a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it's an evil disease. Let me tell you something I have learned. I have learned as I grow older, the only thing to live for is others. When you learn to care about others, that's what makes people love you. I've asked this question to people here many times. What do you like about someone? Do you like someone, do you really look up to them because they've got a new Mercedes in the parking lot and a house out here on the lake? Or do you like somebody who's just selfless? They care about others. They give to others. They go out of the way to do for others. That's when you get the attention that you're looking for with a diamond ring and a Mercedes. They don't give you attention when you got that. They give you envy. Helping others is everything. Uh, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Giving, being, I was selfish when I was young. I made this, I'm holding on to this. I've learned to give away what I've got. I had to learn that. It's the only thing worth living for. When people begin to look to you and say, Jim will help you somehow, and I will. I'm not talking about every bum that comes along and holds his hand and says, give me. I'm talking about people who are really truly in need. That is the most rewarding thing I've ever discovered in the Christian life. It's, being, it's getting rid of self. That's what makes others love you. Not, what about me? When's my turn coming? I need my stuff, my things, and my place, and my... That's not it. I'm out of time. I hope you can see Solomon was master of the genies and the demons. And I believe it comes out of Hiram and out of him having everything he wanted and being master there in the 11th chapter of all these women who were demon worshipers. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for truth. God, deal with our hearts and crush us under your hand. Get rid of this self that we've been into so much in our lives. Thank you for teaching me some of these things, Lord. I pray more and more every day that self dies. Lord, it's all vanity and vexation of spirit just to work for self. Lead us to your elect. Open up many doors for the ministry. We'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, okay. But, uh, we love, love, you, love you, brother. Take care. And um, I'll tell you one thing. All this is so foreign to me. Really? Well, Similar there's a lot of things I've spent. I've spent 59 years in this. Mm -hmm. I've got this unbelievable library in my home. I'll show it to you when you come over. I research everything. Mm -hmm. right. When you yeah, research, <laughs> when you research, you're going to find the truth. The preachers don't know anything about demons. They no, don't. they don't. No. I've never heard this. Well, I haven't ever heard anybody talk about it. I've researched it out of books and out of historians and out of mythology. And, mm -hmm. and when you go into Hastings, just getting into demons and spirits and fairies, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. Because uh, uh, fairies were demons. The Celts call them fairies. The Jews call them demons. The Arabs call them genies. The American Indians call them totem. And they were the same thing. All the same concept, same thing. It was the same thing, a different name and a different culture. Well, Romans called them genius. 
the Greeks called them guardian angels. They'll talk about guardians all through these books. No such thing as guardian angels. God don't need any help in no. declaring the end from the beginning. Right. Does he? Not at all. I mean, he, in his mind, it's already done. That's right. He don't need angels to go around, oops, hey, this guy's getting out of line. Hey, get over here. Yeah. There's nothing new under the sun. Just the same thing done over a different way. That's right. <laughs> and it's all the same thing. You take care, brother. We love, we love you. Come out with BC Wednesday. Do you have a phone number where you are? I, I, well, I've got a cell phone. If you need, Do you? Um, yeah, I've got a cell phone. Do you? We got that. We got your number. It's on the emails. Oh, is it? Okay. It's, it's we, we got it. We got it. And um, Mary's got it in the file. And anything I can do to help you, just feel free to call me. Okay. I mean, okay. You know, I'm, I'm not working. Well, the only thing I can say is just call Mike. Mm -hmm. Mike and... Uh, Mike back there runs all the stuff, and Tom is here on Sunday morning. They do all the work, so if you want to call them, okay. they're the, I'm not the guy who runs the equipment or the, gets out the mailer. I don't have anything. To, I just preach. Huh. Something I do want to do, which I'll talk to them. I've already talked to Tom about it. But, yeah. Uh, where, I'm, where I'm living at now, I don't have high-speed internet. I can't look yeah. at the series on the web. Uh -huh. And in the future, who knows? And so, I'm going to go ahead and buy uh, blank CDs and uh, get with Tom. And I'm going to buy them. I'm going to build a library of what you, the critical issues of what you talk I don't want to be the critical. Well, There's so much information on all right. these DVDs. I can't even begin to tell you. I have spent decades where I'd study 35, 40 hours a week researching. Right. 